Hello everyone and welcome to another lecture in the topic of tachyarrhythmia in our ECG course and our lecture today is titled Atrial Flutter. What we are going to learn today in regard to atrial flutter is how to diagnose atrial flutter in ECG and we are going to learn the types and various patterns of atrial flutter regarding the ECG diagnosis. Of course, we know this scheme in which, which we discuss in the lecture of classification of tachyarrhythmia. And today we are focusing on these types of arrhythmia, which is the atrial flutter, which can present with regular narcomplex tachycardia in case of fixed rate of conduction or irregular form in case of variable rate of conduction. So, the first question that we need to ask ourselves, is atrial flutter an SVT? Because if it is an SVT, why didn't we discuss it in the lectures for supraventricular tachycardia? Of course, the answer is that it is a peculiar type of atrial tachyarrhythmia, and that's why it should be discussed and should be diagnosed separate from SVT, because it has a specific type of management and specific type of response to the same medications that we use to terminate SVT. And that's what we're going to discuss today regarding atrial flutter. Of course, atrial flutter represents a re-entrant mechanism. As we can see here, we can see here like an interior view of the right atrium in which we can see a re-entrant circuit, which is a macro re-entrant circuit inside the whole right atrium. And we can see that there is a slight slowing of conduction at a region called cavotricuspid isthmus. Cavotricuspid isthmus is like the isthmus tissue between the entry of the IVC and the tricuspid annulus. And this is like the target site in which we are focusing to ablate atrial flutter during ablation procedure and also it is the key step to form the re-entrant circuit in atrial flutter. Usually the atrial rate during this re-entrant circuit is 250 to 350 beat per minute. So as an approximation nearly the atrial rate in the flutter is 300 beat per minute. Put this number in your mind because of course it will help us in diagnosis of atrial flutter. If we want to divide the atrial flutter according to the anatomical location, we can divide it into typical atrial flutter and atypical atrial flutter. And the question is typical based on what? Typical based on the re entrant circuit, depending on the cable tricuspid isthmus as an integral part of the circuit. So, if the atrial flutter has this isthmus tissue as a part of the circuit, so it is called typical atrial flutter, which is more common, of course, to say in our practice. And if this atrial flutter doesn't depend on the cable tricuspid isthmus, this means that the circuit, for example, is inside the left atrium, or it may be inside the right atrium, but this cable tricuspid isthmus is not part of the circuit, so we call it a typical atrial flutter, which is less common to be seen. Typical atrial flutter is much more divided into two subtypes, which is the counterclockwise typical atrial flutter and the clockwise typical flutter, which depends on the direction of the circuit, whether it is clockwise or counterclockwise. We need to understand much more information regarding the flutter waves, which will help us to diagnose it. Flutter wave is described as a triphasic component wave. So it is composed of three components. The first component in the typical atrial flutter is a sharp negative deflection because of the atrial septal and left atrial depolarization. Then it is followed by number two wave, which is a low amplitude positive deflection, as you can see here on the diagram on your right hand side, which represents the right atrial lateral wall activation. And then it is followed by a down sloping plateau of isthmus activation because of the cavotricuspid isthmus activation. This appearance, of course, is much, much more clear in lead two and in lead V1. So flutter wave is described as a triphasic component wave, not just a P wave and this characterizes atrial flutter from atrial tachycardia and so this drags us to an important point how to differentiate atrial flutter from atrial tachycardia as we can see here atrial flutter there are flutter waves in between the two complex here we can see two flutter waves because it is flutter with two to one conduction whereas here we see a clear and classic pattern of atrial tachycardia in which we can see two p waves between h2 complex which represent atrial tachycardia with two to one why did we call the first ECG as atrial flutter and the second one as atrial tachycardia? Here we can see that in the first ECG, there are triphasic large flutter wave showing the appearance of so tooth appearance, which is very famous in the atrial flutter, although you don't always see it, but of course it's a very characteristic pattern when you see in the ECG. Whereas here in the second ECG, we can see small discrete P waves, so it is completely different in the morphology. Not, this is not the only difference. There is another difference that nearly there is no isoelectric line in between the flutter waves. It is nearly continuous electrical activity all through 
between the ventricular complex, whereas in atrial tachycardia, there is a clear isoelectric line in between the PE waves. So these two differences represent how to differentiate atrial flutter from atrial tachycardia. In order to decide whether it is counterclockwise or clockwise, it depends on the polarity of the flutter waves in the inferior leads and V1. Here we can see that if we draw an imaginary isoelectric line, we can see that the flutter waves are negative in inferior leads and they are positive in V1, which is not apparent here, but here it is clear that the flutter waves is negative in the inferior leads, and so this represents typical counterclockwise atrial flutter. So if the flutter waves in the typical form is neg are negative in inferior leads and positive in V1, this represents typical counterclockwise atrial flutter, which is much more common. And if it is positive in inferior leads and negative in V1, it is typical clockwise atrial flutter, which is less common to be seen. Let's see this diagram here, which gives an explanation of why the flutter waves appear as a triphasic component, especially in lead 2, and in V1, in case of typical counterclockwise atrial flutter, it appears as a positive wave. The first component of the circuit is an upward activation of the interatrial septal septum and left atrial activation. So this explains that I would see a negative deflection in Li2 because of course the upward activation of the interatrial septum which is moving away from the positive pole of Li2 would result in a negative deflection in Li2 and because it is towards the left atrium it would appear as a positive wave in V1. Then we can see that with the continuing depolarization of the atrium, the circuit returns to be in a downward direction towards the positive pole of Li2, leading to a positive deflection in Li2, and then the slowing activation of the cavo tricuspid isthmus, which results in this plateau, which appears here in Li2 more clearly. So this results in a triphasic component in Li2, which is mainly negative or predominantly negative flutter wave in Li2, and positive wave in V1. And this is a pattern of typical counterclockwise atrial flutter, which is the most common pattern to be seen in atrial flutter. So remember that typical atrial flutter means that the cavo tricuspid isthmus is a critical part of the circuit, and atypical atrial flutter means that the cavo tricuspid isthmus is not a part of the circuit, either it is in the right atrium not involving the isthmus or inside the left atrial wall itself. Of course, there is another way to classify atrial flutter. Apart from the anatomical location, we can classify it into according to the AV relationship. We can classify it into atrial flutter with 2 to 1 AV conduction. This means that from each two flutter wave, only one is conducted to the ventricle, leading to 2 to 1 pattern. And this form of atrial flutter, of course, is regular. And because, as we learned before, that the atrial rate in the flutter is nearly 300 beat per minute, usually the ventricular rate here is about 150. 50 beat per minute. It is a half of the atrial rate. Another pattern is atrial flutter with one to one, which is less common to be seen, but may be seen in younger patients, of course, with intact AV nodal conduction. In this case, of course, the rhythm would be regular and heart rate would be very, very high with approximately 300 beat per minute. And this, of course, may result in hemodynamic instability. And so, of course, is a dangerous pattern of atrial flutter, although not common to be seen. We can have it flutter with 3 to 1 AV conduction. Of course, it would be regular because from each 3 flutter wave, 2 are not conducted and 1 is conducted. And so it is regular rhythm and heart rate is about the third of the atrial rate. So it is nearly 100 P per minute. And the other pattern, which of course is not uncommon to be seen, is atrial flutter with variable AV conduction, in which the AV pattern is variable between 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1 even, in alternate cycles, and so the rhythm would be irregular. Of course, in a clinical situation that you, could, you would see in ER in the reality, you would see regular narrow complex tachycardia. Of course, the first thing to assume that it is SVT. And so you need to classify it into 2 to 1 AV relationship or 1 to 1 AV relationship. If, of course, in case of 2 to 1 AV relationship, you would have two possibilities, either atrial tachycardia with 2 to 1 conduction or atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction. And in case of 1 to 1 AV relationship, of course, the other type of classification is to classify it into short RP and long RP. Atrial flutter is usually not put in the classification of short versus long RP tachycardia because the flutter wave in case of 1 to 1 it conduction, of course, would be slightly in the middle of the RR interval. So it is not usually put in this classification. And of course, atrial flutter with 1 to 1 is not a very common pattern of atrial flutter. So usually you would see 2 to 1 conduction. And of course, we learned how to differentiate atrial tachycardia from atrial flutter with 2 to 1. So this is how to suspect atrial flutter in case of 
presence of regular non-complex tachycardia in the ER. So we are focusing here on this pattern, which is more common. How I know, of course, that this is flutter rather than SVT, because of course, to speak about it in theoretical knowledge, of course, is very easy, but in practice, it may be different or it may be difficult. So if you diagnose it as SVT and give the patient, for example, IV calcium channel blocker or beta blocker, but it was actually atrial flutter, only the tachycardia would not be terminated because the entrance circuit here would not be affected by these medications. Otherwise, the ventricular rate will slow down, showing a pattern of intermittent 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 conduction system before, because of slowing down of the AV nodal conduction, revealing the flutter waves more clearly. So, of course, here, if you diagnose atrial flutter as SVT, when you give the medication, it would give you the clue that it was atrial flutter rather than SVT. You can do the same, of course, with carotid sinus massage, for example, in which it will slow down the AV nodal conduction and so it would reveal the flutter waves. So, how to diagnose flutter waves from SVT? Of course, if it is 2 to 1, it is clear that it is either atrial tachycardia versus flutter and we know how to differentiate it. If it is 1 to 1, sometimes it is easy to see that there is a flutter wave between two complex, but if you cannot differentiate the medication or the carotid sinus massage will give you a clue that it is flutter, not SVT. So, for example, here in this ECG, we could say here that there are two flutter waves in between each two complexes. So, inside the RR interval, two flutter waves, not just one wave. And the heart rate here is nearly 150 beat per minute. And, of course, we need to focus here on the inferior leads, not on V1 or V2, because they are misleading in case of atrial flutter, although they are clear, more clear to see the flutter wave, but it may be difficult to differentiate them from P waves, but in lead 2, it is clear that there is so two's appearance in the lead 2 and lead 3, and of course, one of the flutter wave is nearly fused with the complex. This leads that one of them is much more apparent than the other one. So this is a form of atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction. In this example, we can see an extremely rapid ventricular rate here, and the heart rate is about maybe more than 200 p per minute. Of course, we can assume that this is supraventricular tachycardia, but it is actually atrial flutter with one to one. Because if we look at these waves here, these are actually flutter waves, not just T waves. So these waves may lead us to a diagnosis that this is atrial flutter with one to one conduction. Of course, if you diagnose this as SVT, the clue that would give you like a diagnosis or leading diagnosis to the atrial flutter that you would find slowing down of the ventricular rate with much more apparent flutter waves or the same with carotid sinus massage. So at that time, you can decide that this was atrial flutter with one to one, not just SVT, and you may need DC shock to terminate it. So let's look at this ECG here. We can see here that there is about four flutter waves in between each two complexes. So it is atrial flutter with four to one conduction because from each four waves only one is conducted. And here, of course, we can decide on the polarity of the flutter waves that they are negative in inferior leads and they are positive in V1. So here it is typical counterclockwise atrial flutter with four to one AV conduction. Here we can see this pattern of flutter waves here, in which there is a regular rhythm, but there are flutter waves of fixed morphology in between H2 complexes. So this is atrial flutter with variable rate of conduction, which is not uncommon to be seen. And that's why irregular narrow complex tachycardia could be atrial fibrillation, and of course it could be atrial flutter with variable rate of conduction. And the same may appear with the atrial tachycardia depending on the AV node response. So atrial flutter, can present with a regular rate and can present with a regular rate. Now, at the end of our lecture, we understand how to diagnose atrial flutter in ECG and we understood the notion of triphasic components of flutter waves, which of course differentiated from atrial tachycardia. And we understood the types and various patterns of atrial flutter as we understood the difference between typical and atypical atrial flutter and the difference between clockwise and counterclockwise. And also we understood the various pattern of atrial flutter according to AV node conduction, whether 2 to 1, 1 to 1, 3 to 1, or sometimes variable rate of conduction. And our take home message today is your flutter is a distinct type of SVT that needs to be differentiated from the other types of SVT. It may be regular or irregular according to the AV nodal response. Thank you very much for your listening.